Thanks, Dino. Thank you, thank you. Sit down, sit down, it's okay. Thank you, thank you. You're too kind, you're too kind. I, uh, <laughs> pastoring a church is an interesting thing. Just Christian leadership. You don't go into it unless you really believe that you've had, what drove me into it was I completely had an amazing salvation experience. I'll never forget where I was as a young Christian um, when a guy preached on 2 Chronicles 69. It was out at YWAM, out at Coogee, and uh, went right into me. I was, I, and then he had an altar call. In those days, we always used to have to go out and get on our knees. And, but I remember committing myself to following God and doing whatever he wanted to do. And I was just a young Christian. And that night, it was a Tuesday night, and um, I can't remember, if it was, I'm trying to think who was preaching, it was Dean Sherman or Roger Waters, it was one of the two of them. And they had, those two guys had such a profound impact on Bron and my life. And why don't you come up here for a sex week? Huh? Huh? No, no. Come on. Bring, get, bring your microphone, Bron. Bring your microphone. You remember that, those days we really were impacted, weren't we? You, you share about those days for a minute. Oh, thanks. For giving me the yeah, heads up. Come on, come on, I know. <laughs> I know, I know. But I often talk about being Catholic, and if you've come from the Catholic Church, give me a wave, anyone. Yeah, look, all of us tykes. <laughs> um, and you were taught that the Catholic Church is the one true church, and you never went into another church building, so getting into a meeting that wasn't about the Catholic Church was very scary. I wasn't following God. I knew I wasn't following God. And uh, we often talk about what happened. We went to this little meeting room house at, at was it Dalton Street? Coogee Street. Coogee Street. Mm. And, and packed full of young people worshipping God, raising their hands, singing in tongues. And it was just like probably 40 kids in the lounge room. And... Uh, Mark and I both kind of thought that you've got to have a special language for this. And, and, uh, and Mark responded, and because of my Catholic background, I give God glory for that, gave me a God-centeredness. I knew that our lives had changed forever. We were living, we were sleeping together, and I thought that had changed straight away. He didn't get it, but I got it. <laughs> and I was pretty upset, and... Uh, this quiet, I often, I've told you before, this quiet Anglican girl, obviously, she was trying to be a whammer and reach out and tell people about Jesus. And she nervously turned to me and she, she said, do you know the Lord Jesus? And I said, why don't you mind your own business? <laughs> <laughs> so I was a bit of a, she, she looked like she wilted like a flower under heat, just like that. <laughs> And then I got up and stormed out and got my mini minor and drived off and drove off. And then when I came back, Mark was standing out the front of the building on his crutches. And we're coming home in the car and I say, you know what you've done? And he goes, yeah. He said, but do you really know what you've done? And he goes, well, what are you talking about? And I said, we can't sleep together anymore. And he said, we can't? <laughs> yeah. And then he went, the worst part, okay. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> and God went to work on me for the next two weeks and the thing that won me was not that meeting I went to a little fellowship where we became planted it's full of these old Baptist ex-Baptist ladies with these funny violet hat you know little tiny violets these hats on their head and you know I was barefoot and hippie long dress and braless the sheery top and I thought one of these old birds gives me the eye. I'm telling Mark there are a whole lot bunch of hypocrites and I'm never going back to that place again. And so I, you know, being brought up Catholic with nuns in a convent, I knew exactly how to dress for church. But the point of me telling you this story is about us here now. Because when I went into this little fellowship of about 30 people, mm -hmm. they worshipped God. It wasn't the worship that won me. <laughs> this old doll came up to me. And I was motherless. I'd lost my grandmother who'd raised me. And I was an orphan by then. 
And this old lady came up, and here I'm dressed with the top and everything you could see, and, and I'm daring them to give me just a look. Just a look, and that's it. That's what I want. Give me the look. And she came up and she wrapped her arms around me and she said, oh, it's so lovely to have you here, darling. And I just broke. I just broke because the love of God hit me. And that's what this church can be about. You know, people are going to come into this building that are not like us and different. We were in the 60s and the 70s, the hippie days, the flower people. And we were coming in in the face of traditional religion. And it was the church's ability to change and accept the different type of people coming in. And they loved on me and they became mothers to me because I didn't have a mother. I was 18 and they loved on me and they cared for me and they ministered to me and they discipled me and they put up with all my nonsense and our nonsense. He was crazy. <laughs> and, you know, when I had to get baptised at Calvary Chapel, they're all lined up in their white dresses. I said, no, I'm not going to do it because I couldn't do it just to please people. And that's not right for everyone. But, but, you know, they even accepted me being different then when I refused to fit the mould. And when I got baptised, it was in Kai Hilla in a cow's dark pool. And, you know, you are the love. It's not the pastor. Now, people comes up to, come up to someone who just looks different and doesn't look like they're going to fit in with our church. They're not our kind of people. God forbid that will ever be our church. Our church is the all varieties, all yeah. sorts variety. Yeah. And anyone that comes through this door, should, you should continue to just love them with the love of God. Just sacrificially, just put your arm around them and go up to them and say, it's so lovely to have you here, darling, because that's what changed my life. Very good, Gobo. Thank you. I think the hardest thing about being lead a leader, leaders, is the pressure to be 10 foot above contradiction, the pressure to try and be perfect, the, tr the pressure to try and please everyone, to try and be what other people want you to be. And it's a deadly thing. Um, when I, <laughs> I grew up in a, you know, and you've, I've told the story many times, quite a crazy home with such an old father. And I cannot begin to tell you how negative the atmosphere was that I grew up in. As a tiny little kid, just the trauma of the violence in the home, the verbal violence and uh, my eldest brother, you know, my father, hate, hating his guts, telling him all the time he was going to be cut out of the will and, and the hatred, palpable hatred. Two oldest brothers hated each other's guts. When my middle brother died in um, 2007, the eldest brother wasn't invited to the funeral. You know, this has gone on till he died. Um, and then my eldest brother died two years later in ignominy on his own, in a garage he was living in, hiding from the world. How sad is that? And I call myself the Borf from Bexley. I don't know why God put his hand on me. I was just a Borf from Bexley. What's Borf? I made that word up. It's okay, sorry. I make words up all the time, but anyway, sorry. Drignoid was one of my words. If you ever hear it come round the circle, I invented that word. But anyway... Uh, and my head used to spin. And I used to think, mate, why'd you pick me? You, there's so many people that are better than me, that could do this better than me. And I know the fabric of my soul with that upbringing was deeply affected, incredibly negative. It was Dave's brother, nicknamed me Smiley. It was Dave's brother, Art. And the reason they called me Smiley is because I was so negative. Not because I was happy and smiling. I was, oh, yeah, I, look, get a few in me. If I was drunk, I'd be the life of the party. Jokes. I, I, was, a, I was a walking encyclopedia of jokes. Whilst I, in, whilst I could hold a floor and tell jokes, the reality was that I was a mess. So when I took LSD, I went into dark, dark places. Nearly lost my mind one night. Uh, affected me for, you know, 12 months later. Two incredibly bad trips I had. Um, but this deep negativity and... When I found Christ and I started that, I used to consume everything I could find on faith because I lived in fear. And, you know, Max Warren asked me what my prime destructive emotion was and I said fear. 
I can see why Max says shame. He said when he drilled down, he went beyond fear, and he found shame in him. But for me, it was terrible fear from a tiny little kid. Never told my parents what I was thinking. No one worked out why I stopped eating. I never had a normal diet, severely abnormal diet. Today, I would have been referred to Westmead West Hospital. They've got a special clinic there for kids with dietary problems. Not just women that, that uh, end up in anorexia. I, I, I was eating nothing. I, was sk I found some old photos. I haven't got many photos of me as a kid, but I found one with my two friends, and I, I was so skinny, just a bag of bones, because I wasn't eating. It's a miracle I'm alive. But this negativity, <laughs> and I used to consume everything I could on faith when I got saved. I bought everything. I, I, I think I've got everything Hagen ever wrote, um, etc. Anyone, Don Gossett, all the old guys that used to write on faith. So I used to drill myself with faith. I used to fill my wallet full of scriptures with all the promises to try and combat anxiety. So even when I was at peace, there was always this gnawing anxiety chewing away at me. And even after I became a Christian, five years, I reckon it took, five years of deep counselling, deliverance ministry, working to get rid of the fear. And I remember when Bron had Naomi and I started to have anxiety that led to panic attacks. I couldn't get stuck in traffic. If I got stuck in traffic, I'd start to get sweaty palms. My heart would beat and I'd get myself into a real mess. And uh, you know, I thought, oh, when's this going to stop? When's it going to stop? But my, well, I used to shake in bed of a night violently, ended up with heart palpitations. Uh, and this is as a Christian, a young Christian, drilling myself with the promises I remember I read church history, you know, I'm a lover of history, and one of, my his, one of my heroes in mission history is the dour Scotsman Robert Morrison. I love him with a vengeance, because he was so negative. <laughs> and I love him, he's one of the most determined, stay-at-the-helm men in church history. When on his own, they... When he had a, in his heart, he wanted to go to China and all these people tried to turn him off in England and said the language couldn't be translated. And all the English, all the Germans and all the Westerners in China used translators, Chinese translators, to do business. So the India Company became the East India Company and they took it into China and all the Western world was there plundering China, selling heroin to, uh, to, to pay for their ministry. Did you know that? Protestant missionaries selling drugs to the opium, sorry, not heroin, opium. All the opium, that was Westerners did that to China. It's called the Opium Wars and China fought back. They hated the West for what they'd done to them, addicted them to create a market. But this old, this guy was born in the late 1700s and, and they found a, a scroll in the British Museum from uh, Matteo Ricci. And uh, Ritchie was a, a Jesuit monk that went into China in the 1600s and because the Jesuits were trained in science with astronomy and philosophy and mathematics, he was a, a smart man and then trained in theology and he went into the Chinese court and he got their attention by predicting an eclipse because the Chinese view of the heavens, they had no idea it was a spiritual thing, it was a, it was a, it was a superstitious view of the heavens. And their worldview actually would prevent them from doing science. And he predicted it, and they thought that was impossible. And the next thing you know, the eclipse happened. Anyway, but that guy lived with him. He grew a pigtail. He dressed in Chinese, and he was in the courts, the emperor's court. And he's honored in Chinese history. And he mastered the language so great that he wrote plays in China. Now, to write a play, you need to know the nuance of culture. You've got to understand all of the cultural humour and the things that would hold people spellbound for you to write a play. You really know Chinese. Robert Morrison did the same thing. But anyway, before he went, they found this scroll buried in the bowels of the British Museum. And there was a, a man who was one of his lecturers, had this heart for China as well. Didn't go himself, but he used to fire all the Bible college students up to go there. And... Uh, in his search and in his investigation of the East India Company, everyone trying to stop him doing mission work, the British didn't want the Chinese saved. The British didn't want the Indians saved. They wanted to keep the caste system with them on top, viewed as superior to keep them in place. 
so that they could have a conquest of their nations. It was very wicked. The East India Company and the India Company were very wicked. But um, this man, in, uh, he took a, a, a little Chinese guy that could speak English, an interpreter that came to London, took him into the bowels of the British Museum and they found the scrolls of Matteo Ricci. He had translated the Gospels in the Chinese. And when they found them, they couldn't believe it. As this bloke, they got this scroll and he says, Gospel of John, he starts to read, in the beginning was the word. And they went, oh, it can be translated. And then Robert Morrison, the lecturer, and this little Chinese chap who could speak English, they wrote a dictionary. And Robert learnt Chinese before he went got there but then he had to master the northern dialect and the southern dialect and he had two guys he paid them to live with him and they hated each other's guts he became so good at speaking chinese that uh, all the east india company at macau that's where all the westerners were based he would hear the translators say how much they hated the guys they were doing business with and telling everyone about they were doing rip-off deals anyway and robert morrison was so honest but they loved him. He was the best Chinese-speaking man in the world. There was no number two. He mastered the northern dialect and the southern. He wrote plays for the Chinese. There's so much of what he's written in Chinese has not been translated back into English. Scrolls of it. There's tons of it. But this guy was there to win souls for Christ. But his key goal was they sent him to translate the whole Bible into Chinese, and he did it. His Bible was used the first to win Korea. First Koreans won the Christ were with Robert Morrison's Bible. They threw a Robert Morrison Chinese Bible. They tried to get it to the shores of Japan and they stopped them, but the fishermen went out to meet them. And all the military came out and they said, you new Westerners aren't welcome here, nick off. And they threw a Robert Morrison Bible at the fishermen and, they, and it went into the sea and they pulled it out with a net and it birthed a church in Japan. It birthed a church in Japan. But Robert Morrison, at the end of his life, wrote in his diary, oh, in 10 years, I've won 10 souls to Christ. Last entry in his diary. Woe is me, I have failed. That's what he wrote, and he died. The last entry in his diary was, I have failed. 10 years, 10 souls, and then there's a little tiny sum underneath, 10 times 10 equals 100. He says, what a country. In a hundred years, there may only be a hundred Christians at my rate. As he got on the boat in San Francisco to go across to China, because he could not find a boat out of England to take him, when everyone found out what his mission was to win the Chinese to Christ, he had to go across America and get the San Fran and catch a boat from there. And the captain said, what are you doing? He says, these heathen. He says, it's impossible. You'll never win these heathen to Christ. He says, you're right, I can't. But wait, you see what God will do. That's what he said to the captain of the ship in San Francisco. You know what? I have a picture of Robert Morrison in heaven. Forget Billy Graham. With his millions who have been saved greeting Billy now. Billy's got a line that's nearly, you, know, you couldn't see the end of it, of millions of people that have since died out of his crusades that gave their lives to Christ. But I want to say to you that Robert Morrison was wrong. For in 100 years there were 34 million Christians. In the early 1900s. 34 million Christians in China and they've never been able to stamp it out. But I want you to know that I, I've always battled this negative streak in me. Oh, I've got to watch it. My, my default mode and my flesh mode is negativity. I've got to watch that. And I've had to learn how to walk a faith walk, crucify myself with Christ and stay on track with faith. I've had to do that. Uh, you any different? Anyone here not got a default mode? Anyone here not, don't know where their weaknesses are that need to be crucified daily? Anyone not know? If you don't know, you're a fool. Well, we've got to carry that cross every day. And you know what those default modes? You can't cast it out. You can't counsel it out. You have to kill it. You have to die to it. Oh, that we could cast the old nature out. You can't. Now, we don't want to do the sort of counseling that takes you back to Adam. We'll spend forever counseling you. We don't need to. There are things you crucify. What do you reckon? Yeah, Come on. And like Robert Morrison, the Taoist, they call him the Taoist Scotsman, which means he's you know, so focused and there's not much humor in him and he's so <laughs> the Taoist. On the negative side, but insanely focused. 
I've got to admit, if I remember there was a, one of the prophets we, when we had prophetic presbytery said, oh, in the early, early days would have been um, when I remember we were meeting in Dom Billy's house and one of them said, oh, you know, your life will, has a story. <laughs> and I think one of the stories is one of my word is determination. I'm pretty determined. Take them to blows, you feel like giving up at times, but I'm incredibly determined. The negative side is I stress over people that fail or people that aren't here. People's kids that aren't, you know, that, that have, they're not here. I've got, I've got a kid that's not following Christ. And just stuff, and boy, the devil, there's no Geneva Convention in this battle. He'll hit you high, he'll hit you low. He'll hit you anywhere he can, in any which way he can. And we need to have our, we need to have a fighting position. It's interesting, Paul used the Greek games term for a boxer. They had boxing in the ancient world. And in the Greek, in the Greek word is hupiasio, hupiasio, and it means the knockout punch. So when you're boxing, you want a TKO. The ultimate punch is where you knock your opponent down on the ground and he can't get back up. And bare-fisted fights are pretty heavy stuff. But Paul uses that term on himself. That he regularly ministers the knockout blow to himself. What's he knocking out? He's knocking out the old nature. That stuff in him that he grew up with. Jewish bias. Loathing of Gentiles. Judgmentalism. How deep can it go? Very deep. True? You've got to learn to knock it out. Knock yourself out. Look at the time. I've got here in front of me the first sermon I ever preached in this church. 4th of March, 1995. I thought I'd just touch on it again. And it was about, and I titled it, Many People. And it's out of Acts 18, where Paul goes into Corinth. He'd had a failure in Mars Hill. He'd had a failure in Athens. He went to the central location of Greek success, Athens. And he debated with the philosophers. And he would have the Stoics, you know, he would, he, all these different kinds of philosophers there. And they were bagging him out when he first preached the resurrection. He bagged them out. He held their interest when he used philosophical terms and he quoted some of their own philosophers. But when he got onto the gospel, they started bagging him out about a resurrection. Ah, oh, what a fool. And they bagged him out. He never had a lot of success there. He, got, he did get a few saved. But he came with this failure under his belt. He never had success on Mars Hill. Oh, he had enough to plant a church. It only takes a house full of Christians. That is a church. A house full can be how many? Two, three. Jesus said, boy, if we can get just two to agree, I'm in the midst. We've got action. We've got the beginning of growth. It only takes two to start a cell. Two people that agree. Can you agree? When's the last time you agreed with someone? When have you asked someone to agree with you? When have you got when someone says, let's start a meeting, me and you. Let's start a meeting to bless this church. Let's start a meeting to enlarge the kingdom. Let's start a meeting to, in, to knit our hearts and begin to really pray because Jesus will be with us when we do. He can't help himself. He'll get off his throne and he'll presence himself with you. He loves doing that. Loves it. Paul makes his way into Corinth. What a, what a city. Water and ships. The little slender waistline of Greece from the north to the south. The Peloponnesians on the south. And not that many people live there to this day. They all live on the coast because it's mountainous. And it was never really, you know, a great place in Greece. Although Sparta, the Spartans loved it. They loved the tough terrain. It made tough men. Tough terrain, terrains always make tough men. We all want a smooth sail in our Christian life, don't we? But the likes of Elijah and all the great prophets, they came out of tough places. Most of them were mountain men. Now in America, you say mountain men and every American rises up inside because their pioneers were mountain men. Learn to live in the wilderness. Kill, you know, go around killing what you're going to eat, etc. Tough men that could live in a wilderness. The Greeks were the same. The Spartans were down in the Peloponnesians. This city was only second to Rome in world influence. And I wrote here in my notes, the eastern suburbs with its wealth and its media and 
I'd, uh, I'd been working in 1988. I came up from there and I had to put the tool bag on and I was, you know, I worked for a while in the building trade and I worked on one of the Mojo's houses, you know, the, the Mojo advertising, Morris Johnson. That's what the word stands for, Morris Johnson. And they took the first letters and created the company called Mojo. When I was working there, they were, that company was worth $880 million. And I worked in one of their houses. You've got to see the house to believe it. Back in 88, it was a $1.8 million renovation. And in 1988, that today would be the equivalent of 10 million bucks. You had to see the renovation. And I was, they liked me so much, the, the family asked me back when we finished the job to keep building for them and I renovated their boat shed down on the water and did some work in the house for them and got on well with them and got to share the gospel on that job site with many, many people. But it was a densely populated place Corinth was and at its height there were 200,000 free men and up to 500,000 slaves. And uh, about, that was in about the 7th century but in Paul's day about 200,000 people inhabited the place. The Shires got about 220,000. St. George has got 240, 245. Half a million people within stone's throw of this place. Behind the black wall, we own 800 square metres. You can see 1,000 people behind that black wall. That, over there can become the foyer. The whole youth hall become the foyer into that place. And this can be the overflow hall. I eat all, you rip all the walls out, and you can see 3,000 people in this building. It's 50 metres by 37 metres. You can see nearly 3,000 people in this factory. That's not bad, is it? Buy all the rear units, buy them as they come, available, buy them. <laughs> Sorry. One of the richest and greatest cities in the ancient world, Corinth was. Old Corinth was founded by Dorian invaders in the 8th century. Its port flourished and it became a thriving commercial centre. One of its facilities was the Dialocus, a paved causeway. It used to draw ships across the isthmus on rollers. This was to avoid the long and dangerous passage around the Cape, Malia, in the southern tip of the Peloponnesians, there are always big storms around capes. In all nations, there's storms around capes where currents meet and seas meet and big storms blow up. So they used to go up to the isthmus of Corinth and the slaves used to drag the ships out of the water and across logs right across for about literally 16 kilometres. 16 kilometres. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, 13 kilometres. 13 kilometres, four to eight miles. And it was, uh, they ended up building a... Building a um, a, a causeway through there in the late 1800s. The ancient Greeks dragged the boats across it. And so all the, all the sailors, when they were dragging the boats, would party in Corinth. The highest hill, there was Aphrodite, a temple to Aphrodite. And it was a wicked thing, a wicked, wicked, wicked place. And it was just based on sex. So in Roman times, the city was notorious, a place of wealth and indulgence, to live as a Corinthian, or to behave as a Corinthian meant to live in luxury and immorality. As a seaport, it was a meeting place for all nationalities that offered all kinds of attending vices. What about our city last night, eh? I won't go there. I won't say any more. But our city last night, not just out in the Mardi Gras, I'm telling you, I could tell you stories about past Mardi Gras, and we've known people that have, in the old days, it used to end in the Horden Pavilion. I knew someone that set a business up there to sell food, and in the end... They had to pack up and leave because of what was happening publicly in front of everyone in that pavilion. Our city's getting a reputation. Plato opposed enslavement of Greeks by Greeks regarding bond servants as essentially inferior beings. His pupil Aristotle considered slaves as mere tools, lucky to have the guidance of their masters. Wars, piracy and debt were the main sources of slaves for the Greek. In the slave markets of Athens, Rhodes and Corinth, and Delos, a thousand slaves might change hands in a single afternoon. After a major battle, as many as 20,000 slaves might go on the block. The Roman, it was notorious for its indulgence, though. Sorry. The Temple of Aphrodite on Acho Corinth, at the highest hill in Corinth, was unique in Greece. Its priestess, priestesses were more than a, more than a thousand, hero, oh, I can't even say the Greek word, sacred slaves who engaged in prostitution. Her main festival was Aphrodisia. Does that, that word ring a bell to anyone? <laughs> oh, this just isn't sex. This is homosexual sex as well. And children, I'm sad to say, which was celebrated annually in midsummer. In Laconia, Aphrodite was worshipped as a warrior goddess. She was also the patron goddess of prostitutes, etc. You can get the picture. You can get the picture. 
So a thousand temple prostitutes on the highest hill would have been the first thing the sailors saw in there at sea was the mountain going, yeah, party tonight, girls, available like you wouldn't believe. And of course, this church, I planted it in Coogee, in eastern suburbs, and it has, it's got its own reputation. But you know what? God takes us to where, the pe- where it's the worst, don't you, don't you think? Look at Robert Morrison, determined to go into Macau in China. You've got no idea, uh, Mosley, the Reverend Mosley, I think the guy that was the Bible College lecturer, and he'd done all this research, and everyone turned him off and said, you'll never win the Chinese. You can't translate the language into English. Now, what rubbish is that? Anything to turn him off. But determination, and Paul's determined to go to this city, and he had massive spiritual opposition. The synagogue Jews in right, the synagogue Jews in right and blaspheme. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Can you throw up Acts 18 and go to the fir- put the first four verses up for me? Thanks. I've got it on the rear wall. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Next verse. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy and his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and he came to them. We've got that in history. Um, quoted someone that wrote the history of the Caesars. Next verse, you've got three. So, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. All Jews in their teenage years apprenticed to their father. They all have to learn a craft so that if times ever get bad, they've got something they can work with their hands for. Now, Paul was a lawyer. He trained under Gamaliel, and they're the top, the top barrister in the city. The top barrister in the nation was Gamaliel, and Paul had trained under him to be a barrister to be an interpreter of God's law in the Jewish culture. doesn't get any higher. Yet we're shocked because this guy sews skins together and makes tents. And here he is, humbling himself. He's come into this city probably penniless. He's been traveling. And the first thing he does, he needs a job. And he's willing to make tents. And he finds these Jews that have been kicked out of Rome. Now, everyone, all the commentators are divided down the middle. Is he a Christian? Has he found Christ in Rome? Or is he just a Jew? Well, it doesn't tell us he's a Christian. He's just a certain Jew with his wife Priscilla. By the way, the rest of the occurrences in the New Testament put Priscilla first and put him second. What's that tell you? Well, we know that when Paul started his ministry, Barnabas' name always comes up first, then Saul or Paul. And then finally, when Paul steps up and begins to operate in his ministry, the names are reversed and it's always Paul and Barnabas. His wife's mentioned first. I reckon she had the goods, this girl. A lot of girls get mentioned by Paul. Women are important to Paul. Very important. But Paul, so because he was the same trade, he stayed with them. They didn't know what they invited into their house. They invited someone that's been knocked off his horse by Christ. They've invited someone that's been told he's going to reach kings. A kingmaker. A kingsaver a nation changer, and he's living with a pair of tent makers. The commonality is Jews, and they're bound by hospitality. He had no money. He needs a job, and he needs somewhere to stay. And he finds this couple who are open to him, and in they take him. But Paul's been working in Antioch, one of the most relational churches in the New Testament. Jerusalem isn't. Jerusalem battled legalism and pharisaicalism the whole way through. Peter was scared witless after being asked into Cornelius' house. He had to rehearse what he was going to say so he wouldn't put a word wrong because of the religiosity and the pharisaicalism. What is it about religion? What is it about our Christianity that we can become so judgmental? We want to rip the guts out of anyone that's not like us. Heaven help us all. What do you reckon? Pharisaicalism is this close to us all. A whole lot of us. When's the last time you were upset? When's the last time change frightened you? Just change. There's going to be change in this church. True or false? Can you, can you hack it? We're supposed to embrace change, you know. Part of maturing, just maturing, means you've got to change. Some of you used to like to suck your own flame and thumb. You loved your thumb. And your thumb was in your mouth for a long time. 
Mom and dad were worried about your teeth and your future for your teeth. We had to get that thumb out of your mouth. We put horrible things on your thumbs. What sort of things they put on kids' thumbs? What do we, what do, we do? Pepper? Pepper? Chili oil. <laughs> Try that on your dog if it's chewing the skirtings. <laughs> That'll stop him. But you don't like it. We don't like change. Growing up, taking responsibility, stopping tantrums, stopping emotional blackmail, stop acting like a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old. We've got to become adults. Some of us are adults, but we're still internally, emotionally very stunted. And we carry on and we soak and we do all kinds of stuff. It's not permissible. We may have done it. We could be still doing it, but it's going to stop. Ultimately, we have to stop and we've got to grow up and be adults. We've got to learn how to stand in Christ. Be pillars that aren't moved by things, aren't moved by people's failures, aren't moved when things go wrong, aren't moved by the sins of others. Some people want to give up everything because of the sins of others. The number one stress on every one of our lives is you feel like you want to give up because of the sins of others. You've got to keep reminding yourself that you're not responsible for the sins of others. I'm responsible for me and I'm responsible for my reactions. You're not responsible for the sins of others. Why is it that someone commits a sin and it destroys churches? The whole church fails? That's a weak church. Wickedness? You want to plant a city in wickedness? Child molesters, man. The name's in the Greek. It's translated catamite. In all the sexual sins, he lists in this city, in 1 Corinthians 6, there's a special Greek word. Hey, imagine living in this city. You'd have to watch your kids like a flaming hawk. You've got to watch everyone like a hawk. You've got to watch your daughters like a hawk. You can't walk down the street without being hit on. <laughs> he lives with them. Oh, what have they got their home? Well, someone that's learned to do discipleship in Antioch, the best church in the entire New Testament. And he was in it up to here as a basic Bible teacher, but he learnt relationships. How do I know he learnt relationships? Because I've just been doing a major study on Paul and love. And my God, the demands that he gives us to love each other are insane. Of how to love one another. Where do you learn to love one another? In a meeting like this? Come late, go early, not say a single word to anyone. That's bull. It's a load of bull. This is not church when we don't talk to anyone. It's not. Yeah, the word's good. Oh, the worship. My God, I'll take God all day. But let the people get stuff. I don't like half of them. What is that? Is that Christianity? That's why we've got to go face to face somewhere in our lives. Often. I often. Murray Newman said to me the other day, Phil Pringles now, him and his wife have gone nuts on micro church. Murray said to me, he's prophetic, Phil. He's always leading the way. He's ahead. He's ahead. He's ahead. They're trying to get in the micro church. They realize the future's micro church, not mega church. You can come and go and not say a word to anyone. Come and go, no one knows you. Come and go, take it as you like. Oh, don't like that, I'm going early. You know, whatever. Connect with no one. Now Phil and his wife are nuts. They're going nuts trying to really connect people. We're on the right track. The only church that can survive persecution is where we've learned to go face to face and every one of you can be a leader. You're frustrated, you want to do something in the church? Want to do more in the church? How about starting a small group? How about I challenge you today to find one flaming person that'll agree with you? Is there anyone you can agree with? Is there anyone? Because if you can't find someone to agree with you, you better be on this altar call today. You have a problem. <laughs> oh, Sorry. Sorry. Next verse. What did they have in their house? Someone that's learnt the power of Christ in the midst. Jesus in the midst. That we celebrate Christ in the midst, not the leader of Christ in the midst. Christ in you. We've got Christ in us. And Paul reminds them in 2 Corinthians, it's Christ in us. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Next verse. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. 
Who's driving Paul? You know, years ago I had a group of people. They wanted me to read Rob Bell's book called Velvet Elvis. There's a group left, and they accused me of being the Velvet Elvis generation. So in the 50s and 60s, everyone used to have a Velvet Elvis, black and purple, with these big swirly hairdo and sequins and that, all on the lounge room wall. It became an embarrassment in the 70s, and they put it in the basement. You know, I found that book. I've been cleaning my office all week. Well, I've been cleaning it for stinking months, haven't I? Poor old Lil, I've been trying to get Lil in there, and I've got so much junk, 45 years worth of junk. Still chucking stuff out. But I found this book. They gave it to me to read before they left. And I read some stuff in that book that absolutely horrified me against evangelism, against reaching out to people, against reaching the lost, against friendship evangelism. It said it was using people. That was all underlined. I didn't underline it. But I sat down and I was gobsmacked as I read it. Thank God for the yellow bin. I've got the biggest round file at the moment. I have chucked out some trash, I can't tell you. That book is trash. The man that wrote it is a failed megachurch pastor today. Failed. Universalist believes that grace is so great, everyone's going to heaven. No need to preach the gospel, everyone's going to heaven anyway. What rubbish is the Holy Spirit doing what to Paul? What's the Holy Spirit doing? What's he doing? Compelling. You can't stop yourself. You've got to. You've got to say the truth. You've got to. It's eternal life. People have an eternal spirit and salvation counts. If we aren't grateful for our salvation, you'll never share the gospel with anyone. If you aren't saved in your heart of hearts and recognize that you need to give your life to Christ, you'll never change. You won't care. It's a first port of call. It's a foundation, an absolute foundation. The only reason I shared the gospel is because the gospel's impacted me. Compelled by the Spirit, not by Jewish theology, not by the Antioch elders, not by the guys that discipled him, by the Spirit. Next verse. We've got to be compelled. When they opposed him and blasphemed, when they started blaspheming his God and Christ, in blaspheming Christ, they're blaspheming God, he walked away. And at time, there's going to be a time, how hard is it to walk away? If you blame yourself for the sins of others, if your goal in life is to upset no one, you're stuffed as a Christian. You're stuffed. If you're worried about the reactions of everyone, you tiptoe on the daisies and you live on eggshells, you are not living the Christian life. You are not living the Christian life. People get upset. We all get upset. I hate being confronted when I'm wrong. I hate being confronted when I'm in sin, don't you? I hate it. And it's the only time people really care. Because they care enough to say, hey, you're drifting from love. You've drifted from love. You've drifted. And Paul said, that's it. Shook his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clean. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. When they started blaspheming, mate, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, there's preachers around the place now. I've heard about them. I won't name one. But he had a meeting with ministers about two years ago in L.A., he got deeply hurt, lost a mega church, lost one. A whole lot, 16 million bucks worth of buildings had to be sold. Everyone, thousands, 16,000 people scattered. How many of them are not following Christ today? All I know is that he blames one evangelical pastor, and in this meeting, swore his head off about this man. And when I say swear, I mean, mate, sailor language. The big F, the big C, the whole thing, boy. With a whole bunch of ministers listening. And as far as I know, not one guy got up and walked out. I would have got up and walked out. Wouldn't you? What would you do? Oh, no, well, he's a mystery. Oh, come on, he's been hurt. He's been hurt. What is blasphemy? Does our mouth count? Does our language count? I think so. He said, that's it. That's it. You idiots. That's it. Now, whilst he did that, let's look at the next verse. He says, from now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. He departed from there and ended in the house of a certain man named Justice, who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. I reckon he was from that synagogue. And he obviously walked out with Paul. And he believed Paul's message and he received Christ. And I reckon it was like Newtown. 
I reckon it was like Paddington. The isthmus is small. You've got to fit 200,000 people in the small isthmus, and they're all living in terrace houses. And we've got a common wall between us. And I can imagine Paul's meeting versus the meeting next door. They, he left with them blaspheming. How long did it take them to calm down? How, what were they doing? And he would have known when they, he walked out that they would have been planning his demise, his death. He had done it himself. He calls himself a hitman for the Jews. He had planned the death of others. He knew that they would resort to that. You know, as it is, as the whole group took vows against him, a vow to death. I will not eat until Paul is dead. People did that with the Apostle Paul. Takes a bit of guts to be a Christian leader. Yes, you can't keep everyone happy. You can never keep anyone happy. But if you get unhappy and if you're developing opinions against pastors and leaders, be careful. Be careful. Let it go. Some people will never let it go. They want to see him destroyed. They want to see him out of the ministry. They want to see him publicly punished. Don't do it. I've been around. Why am I still here? Because I've learned a few lessons. In the house next door, next verse. This is wonderful, the next verse. Then Christmas, the, Crispus, the ruler of that synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household. And many at Corinth, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Why did this guy turn his heart? Because he would have been shocked because his leadership team was saying, that scum bucket Paul, effing so-and-so. Kill him! Where is he? Oh, he's on about a load of rubbish. Everything's on about some rubbish. And, and he would have been, these are the guys I've been doing life with. These are the guys I'm worshipping God with. No, thank you. I'll have that guy. And all the time through the wall, the common wall of the terrace house, we could hear, Yeehaw! I exalt thee. And I would have been hearing the dancing, praise time, worship time. Yeehaw! Day more whistling <laughs> when we worship God. I know what I would want, wouldn't you? Give me a sweet spirit. Give me someone that's preaching love. Give me someone that's preaching Christ. Give me someone that's preaching salvation. Give me someone that's a forgiver. A forgiver. And yet he walked out and dusted himself. He's a forgiver. The best love, someone that's exuding and demonstrating the love of God in Christ. No one has done it better. And his letters prove it. Yeah, there's always opposition. It's a pain from, it's a pain where opposition comes from. It's a pain. It's a pain. I care about people. I hate it. I hate it. And I beat myself up when people fail. I've had to fight myself for wanting to blame myself all the time for every failure. Because that's my default mode. I grew up in avoidance mode. Upset no one. Don't upset your father. We all learned to tiptoe around dad who's a flaming volcano. And when he blows, it explodes. Not a nice environment to, to form a personality on and learn life skills and how to do life. I had no Boy Scouts, no groups. I, the old man had no car. We went nowhere. I never socialised, only with my two mates. Across the road and around the corner, two friends. And that was it. And we're all as broken as each other. Kid across the road's father used to beat the mother black and blue. And I know it had an effect on his eldest brother. My God, it had an effect on him. He saw it and lived with it longer than the rest. Next verse. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night vision, don't you be afraid, but speak and don't you hold silent. Hey, don't you hold silent. Next verse, for I am with you, and no one will attack you and hurt you, for I have... Question, there's 100 churches in the Shire, most of them have only got 30 and 40 people, most of them. Some of them have hundreds, some of them have hundreds, but not many. How many Christians in 100 churches in the Shire? Anyone want to take a stab? Trust me, it's not 100,000, I'll tell you that. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere near it. We have a small percentage, and all I know is that God has many people in this Shire. What do you reckon? Many people. The old King James says, much people. I used to love that old phrase, much people. There's much people here. Open your eyes. Don't see the gay Mardi Gras. Don't see this. Don't see the problems. Oh, so many of us are problematic in our thinking and seeing. It affects our visioning. It affects your praying. It affects your faith. It affects your doing. Because in the end, it's what we do. Faith is not what I think I believe. It's what I do. And I've got to, in spite of fear, I act in spite of fear. I've stepped out in faith with fear raging in me, and God has won over the fear. 
I've left fear behind because I've learned to step out. We've learned to step out. Bron's been in this up to her ears. She's carried the pressure with me. It's us, not me. It's us. Us. That's how you overcome fear. You do it anyway. Be afraid, but do it anyway. And prove the devil to be a stinking liar. He's a liar. Don't you hold back. So Paul in a night... Don't you be frightened. He's starting to think about next door and the threats and the anger. When they all come out of church, they come out of church at the same time. Except there's hundreds next door and I've got a house church. And when they all walk out, I've got a hundred scowling faces. And they're all saying, we'll get you, we'll kill you. They're next door. He sees them all the time. He sees them in the streets and they hate his guts. And if you're not getting good positive input all the time, if you're not getting, if you haven't got a source of encouragement, you're going to be gone. We all need to be encouraged in spite of our fears. If you do a study on Joshua, Moses encouraged him. God encouraged him. God says to Moses, go and encourage him again. You've got so much encouragement. God's with you. God's with you. Because why? The task is going to be flaming hard. You're going to take this scared bunch of men and you're going to turn them into a pack of warriors because the promises of God still demand that you learn to swing steel, that you get involved in battle, that you're going to have to physically kill people. You're going to have to do it. And when you face men together with shining blades and shields, boy, and everyone's saying, we are win, and they thump their shields with their swords, and they scream like Vikings used to. When men come together with battle, it's a gigantic adrenaline rush, and men get furious. You've got to pump yourself up against the enemy to give yourself some oomph to go in and fight. Mate, when Joshua's got to lead this bunch, who had been terrified of the fight, had been terrified at the thought of giants, had been terrified. And here's Paul, scared. Don't you be afraid. Don't you give up. Don't you leave town now. It's not time to leave town now because I've got much people in this place. Mate, when I preach that, how many people do I preach that to? Well, I invited everything but the cat and dog that day and our first meeting in Coogee Primary School was 50 people. 50, 55 people. I invited friends. The next week, we had reality, 18 that was including six kids and three adults I brought with me. We would set up, play music. And we were worshipping this morning. A young girl walked in. Newspapers under her arm says, what's going on here? Is this, what is this? I said, oh, it's church. She said, oh, I'll take my papers back to the dad and I'll be back. I'll be, I'm coming back. She came back, gave her life to Christ, became one of our key worship girls. Walking past the street. But that's not the way to do it. Amy and I, Amy and Renee and I, we let a box drop. No, Amy and Renee used to come out with me late at night and I'd go all over Coogee, starting from all the houses around the hall and bleeding right down to the beach. Letterbox, thousands of houses, reaching out to people. I had to start over there. There was a limit put on. I couldn't start in the Shire because of the church of Sutherland. I had to go X amount of Ks away. And uh, that's where I decided to go back. I felt God told me to go back to my roots. We preached our guts out over there for a couple of number of years in the eastern suburbs. And uh, people got impacted and we started to grow. And I remember our first house meetings. I remember, in, I remember our first house meetings. But Paul stays for 18 months. His fear had substance. And God says, don't you shut your mouth. When, when you shut up and you go silent, what's going on? When all of us go silent, the moment you go silent in the face of opposition, we're in trouble. Because when you go silent, the voice inside your head is screaming at you, you're gone, you're gone, you're gone. You're going to fail. You're a loser. You're broken. You're full of fear. You're nothing. When you're silent, you're living with his voice. We've got to speak the truth out when you're feeling like that. If there's ever a time to speak the truth out, that's now. Thank God for the little house meeting next to the synagogue. For that little house meeting exploded into a church, a huge church. That little house meeting exploded and thank God for the multicultures, thank God for all the sexual problems, thank God for the divisions, thank God for all the brokenness, thank God! Because we've got a full-on revival on our hands called the charismatic Pentecostal renewal and it's all come out of the letters to Corinth. If Paul, if they weren't having so much trouble and Paul didn't have to write to them to correct them, we wouldn't know anything about the grace gifts. Nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, ministries of glory, ministries of miracles, all sorts of stuff. We wouldn't know. We, would we? We wouldn't know. Thank God he stayed. Thank God he grew the church. 
because it's affected the 20th century in the church at the end of time. Yeah. We're here because of this church. Yeah. Why did I preach my first sermon from this church? Because it was a Holy Ghost church. It was the normal for everyone to speak in tongues. It was normal for everyone to have the gifts flowing, even though they were broken, even though there was filth going on in the church. They were a broken bunch. They had all sorts saved. Every sexual deviation was saved. People came out of lifestyles. You look at 1 Corinthians 6 and he says, and such were some of you. <laughs> Next verse. And he continued there, a year and six months, teaching the word of God. Next verse. When Galileo was proconsular Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Next verse, so they moved on him now, they're going to try and get him killed, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Next verse, when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo, he didn't even get one word out. Galileo says, for a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be, there would be reason why I should bear with you. Next verse, but it is a question of words and names and your own law. Look to it yourselves, for I don't want to be the judge of such matters. Next verse, and he drove them out from that judgment seat. Paul goes, ah, and he just goes, right, out of court, get out, matter thrown out. Mate, he's a barrister. He knew how to defend himself. He was going to do it a good deal. And he would have had Jesus' words ringing through his ears. When you get dragged before the judgment seat, don't plan, speak extemporaneously. Speak from your heart. Do not plan a defense. In your last mouthfuls, I'll give you revelation that'll nail everyone to the wall and he didn't get to say one flame of word. Oh, God has much people in this city, all right. This is a man who's for God. Who knows that the council, who knows that that happened to this church when we, tried to, when we bought this building? I don't want to knock the Labor Party, but I'm, I, all I know is that Labor Council said, you're not putting a church here. And in the end, um, they said we were rather brothels and churches. There's brothels around the corner, Parowina Road. Probably ones we don't even know about. But people will stand up for you and speak for you. And in the end, mate, council got changed uh, right at that critical point. And the next council came in and let us put the church here. Much people. Paul doesn't get to say a word. And one of these people was Gal Gal Galio was for him, he would have been so shocked. And he drove them out from the judgment seat. Next verse. And the guy that led the attack was the new leader of the synagogue that they replaced the other guy with. It says, then all the Greeks took Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, beating to crap before the judgment seat. And this judge took no notice of these things. He didn't care that Paul was being beaten within an inch of his life. All I know is the apostle Paul was there when that happened. And I've said that from this pulpit in the past. I can see Paul wait until the beatings were all over. Maybe he even got in there and took a few punches to try and save this bloke. And he would have shown him love. He would have picked that guy up, took, taken him home, cleaned him up. And that guy now knows how much the city hates his guts. How would you like to be that guy living in that city? Where everyone freely beats you up and you've got no recourse to law. You can't call the police. You can't get a judge. You have just been beaten publicly in front of the, the highest system of law in, the, in that, that, that city. No one cares. Matter of fact, how safe would you feel for the rest of your life walking around that city? 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, Greetings, Corinth, especially to Sothenes, our brother. He gave his life to Christ, folks. Oh, there's much people. And the guys who are absolutely the number one contenders against being against us can still end up being in our midst. Who knows that's true? God has much people. The wall... The building size where we've been planted is a plan of God. The big issue is, though, it's not just the numbers. It's that we connect. Yeah. That we do what Paul did and you start in a house. This church was started in a house with a guy, uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Notice I put her name first. Priscilla and Aquila. And all the way through, he gives them honor. And finally, they end up back in Rome and they've got a house church there. And he talks about how much all the saints respect them. You know, your home is a ministry centre. Can I encourage you all to be hospitable? Invite people into your home. Start inviting people from church back to your home. Invite one another into your home. 
And when you're having your home, go to, when people end up your home, have fellowship around Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Ask key questions. What can we do to further the kingdom together? How can our friendship increase? What can we do to really love one another, recognize one another, share each other's pain, get healed with each other? Because we've all got stuff to be healed from, haven't we? Some of us have got very controlling things in our lives. Some of us have got relational you know, aberrations that are absolutely, you know, knocking the legs out from under our bodies, ruining our relationships, ruining our hope for love, ruining our hope for friendship, ruining our hope for closeness. We've been called to friendship. We've been called to love each other. And boy, this church started like that. The first converts would have been Priscilla and Aquila in their own home because they asked Paul in. Hospitality opened the door for the gospel. And this couple became a key couple. And when he leaves Corinth, he takes them with him. Come on. You'll never know. The door's got to open. You get this right. You get this right. Learn how to love each other. Learn how to fellowship. Learn how to grow. Learn how to win one and raise one. True. Discipleship is about relationships. And relationships aren't easy. True? Oh yeah, God, God looked after him and protected him. But we know there's more than what the account, this small account of this church being planted. Because this church got sown with the power of God. This church had miracle ministries. This church had at least three prophets. I I want a church like that. I want a church with the prophetic. So does Lou and Felix. They want a church with the Holy Spirit. We want a church with the power of God. What do you reckon? Oh, there's more. Go for it all, will you? I'm at the end of my journey. It's not over. But brother and I have got the grief also of just about life changes and that life point. I'm 68 in September. You know, the Bible, David said, you're doing well to hit 70. If you go to 80, my God, you've done well. These days, you can go to the average age, about 82 now for a man. I think we've lifted it up so high. But the reality is we're still going to die. Live your life for Christ before it's too late. Give him your all. Go to work for Jesus while there's time. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Paul's first Paul's first church where he was working was so full of love it was the first place in the world to be called they called the followers of Jesus Christians and it just simply means Christ in one's that Christ is in these people. Boy, Christ is in them. Boy, they love each other. Boy, they love the community. Boy, they love the poor. Boy, they love people. Christ in ones. That's where Paul's ministry was birthed. He himself got called a Christian. How wonderful if the world calls us Christians and they don't spit after they say it. What do you think? Romans 12, 9, don't, this is Paul's words, don't just pretend that you love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Stand on the side of good. Romans 12, 10, next verse. Love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honouring each other. Mate, it's not easy, eh? In 23 years, some of you have been around this church for a while, I ask your forgiveness if I've hurt you. I ask your forgiveness if Bron and I have offended you. In 23 years, a lot of words can get said. In 23 years, there can be a lot of reaction. Lots of reactions. And I'm an emotional sort of bloke, and I can blurt stuff out, and I'm very passionate. I've also lived to regret things I've said and I've had to ask people to forgive me many, many times. 
And I do it this morning in my last sermon. If I've hurt you, if I've come across as crass or unfeeling or unthinking, plain dumb, I ask your forgiveness. And uh, I want the best for you guys. The absolute best. May the Lord bless every one of you. May all of you be in, encouraged, enlarged on your insides. May every one of you make it to maturity. May every one of you make it to maturity. In 2 Corinthians, Paul uses the word for maturity. He says, and this we pray also for your all round strengthening and perfecting. 2 Corinthians. And he uses the katarismos word out of Ephesians. May you mature. And listen, let me read the words. I'm going to pray for you. May you be restored. May you be made complete. This is the one verse. I'm enlarging the Greek now out of the lexicon. May you be made complete. May you be restored. May you come to maturity. May it all come together in your lives. May you be perfect and reformed. May you be made complete. May you have restoration to maturity. May you have true Christian maturity. May you have improvement. May you have experienced the perfecting of your characters. Holy Spirit loves you too much to leave you as you are. He's going to mature you so that you be no longer children tossed to and fro by every wind and thought and the attitudes and judgments of other human beings. May you be Christ's man and woman through and through. May you have conviction in the guts. May you have steel, titanium running through your spine, all the way down to your toes. That no wind, no storm, no rain, no nothing, no, no flood will ever take you off the rock. May you make it to rock before you die. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm finished.